So there seems to be one common theme that I keep hearing from all the speakers and, and the people that I've met tonight, and that's that the world does a really good job of, uh, of telling us or making us feel like we can't do something. It does a really good job of discouraging us. And uh, according to the world, a guy like me shouldn't be up here in front of you right now. Yes, I'm, I'm just a bartender. Uh, when I grew up going through school, I was never the best student. I was, I was very much a C student, and that, that's why they call it average. I'm, I'm average. And actually, one quick thing, Eustace, who spoke earlier, came and spoke at my elementary school uh, in Greensboro. This was, uh, this was what, 20-something years ago, and I remember one thing was this guy broke the rules. I like that. And it took me a long time how to figure out how to do it, but I did. Again, I, w I shouldn't be here right now. I was never the star athlete. I love sports. I love wrestling and football and, and baseball. I never got the MVP award. I was never asked to come up anywhere and get a trophy. I played because I had fun. So the world did a good job of telling me a guy like, a guy like me is not really going to be that great or exceptional or be able to have a very profound impact on the world around me because I'm just a regular, ordinary guy. But then something happened. In 2003, I learned about the world's water crisis as a bartender. I learned that water kills more children than anything else in the world. Number two, is HIV AIDS, which we all know well. Number three is malaria, which of course we all know well. Malaria killed more of our soldiers in Vietnam than bullets. Number four is tuberculosis. Water kills more than all three of those combined. Yet no one, especially in 2003, knew anything about this crisis really. And I was not happy, to say the least, when I learned about this. And that's when something, the only thing I guess I could use to describe it is, is the word passion. Something happened in me. I got angry. I got pissed off. But I also decided, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to sit here and do nothing about this. I may just be a bartender. I may just be a very ordinary person. But I'm going to use the tools and the resources that I have around me to make a difference. And so what did I do? In early 2004, I created an organization called Wine to Water. Obviously, it's a play of on words on Christ's first miracle. There was a great, fun wedding party. Everybody was having a blast. And in that biblical story, they ran out of, uh, of wine. So we know the story well. Christ took water and made not just any wine, great wine. Well, here in the West, we have wine and anything we want all around us. So I figured maybe as a bartender, I could figure out a way to take what we have plenty and give to the rest of the world that has so very little. I'd never held an event before. I'd never spoken in front of more people than what was in my 20 to 30 person classroom growing up. But I knew that I had to do something about this crisis, and so I did. After I started this, it wasn't even an organization in the beginning, it was just more like a little movement. One and a half months after that, I, uh, I held my first event called a wine to water event and we blew it out. I was shocked at the response because I found out there's a lot of ordinary, regular, everyday people out there just like me that are dying to make a difference in this world. After a few more events, very, very close to follow, I found myself six months after my first event I found myself living in the place you see behind me, known as Darfur, Sudan. I'm not going to fill in all the details of how I got there because I know that we don't have the longest time, but six months after my very first event, I'm living in Darfur, the worst humanitarian crisis facing our world, arguably even up until this point today. I spent a year there in Darfur, and I decided while I was there, I was also going to be not just working in the 
the way that everybody else worked. I decided to do things different. I found the, the marginalized people in that community. In my community back in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I started Wine to Water, I used the marginalized community. I used the bar crowd, the regulars that were around me to create this organization. The people that, that everyone else says, y'all, you can't, you're too ordinary, you're too regular, you can't do anything. When I landed on Darfur, I found that throughout Darfur, there's different areas called UN no-go zones, which means anybody affiliated with the UN is not allowed to go there because it's too dangerous. But I also learned that that's where the greatest need was for water. So that's where I decided to work. And those people behind me is a group of, uh, a group of rebel soldiers that I fell in love with. I, I, when I began to meet with them, before I would even come to talk to them about the work that I wanted to do with water, and how that the thing that's killing their children, it's not some evil spirit from somewhere that they can't figure out and they can bring a witch doctor over to fix it. No, it's simple, it's the water. But before I could tell them that, I got to know them as people and built a relationship. Kind of similar to how I would do just behind the bar with a new customer coming in. What was more important to me was getting to know their name and figuring out who they were before I just threw a drink in front of them and tried to get a big tip out of them. The people are what's important. And after I could sit down with the rebel commanders and find out just exactly what kind of people that they are, that they're just like you and I, then I could share with them that their water is poison. The government of Sudan actually utilized the Janjaweed, a group of extreme Arab uh, militia in Darfur, to poison their water, actually. After they would be done in an area and, and kill some people, they would dump the bodies in the water source and pollute it. So I could explain this to them and I began teaching them how to utilize the materials around them to clean their water sources. And then I met this guy, he changed my life forever. So I thought I had passion before, something that drove me, something that, that made me want to wake up in the morning and do something. And then I met him, his name is Mustafa. He's 12 years old in this picture. He's been fighting since he was nine. For three years, he's probably killed more people than most of our, most of our soldiers and most any of us would ever want to think about. And I was sitting with his commander one night around a fire. We had just had slaughtered a goat and we were kind of celebrating my return back to their area. And I said, you know, what are you scared of, man? You, you guys, they have, they have no emotion on their faces. What scares you? And he, he, he was quiet for a minute and he said, you know, it's not the fight that we have tomorrow. It's not the bullets that are whizzing by our ears each day when we go and fight against the government and the Janjawi. It's that children in our community, children like Mustafa and my kids, can't get over the diarrhea that they've had for the last three weeks. He was more afraid of their water source than the bullets that they were facing every day. And that's when it, it wasn't my passion anymore. That's when water became the burden of my life. And I knew that I would never do anything else but fight this crisis. So I did what I could do. I utilized locals in every area. When I came home from Darfur, I'd like to say that I immediately went out and began growing this organization, but it took me a while. It took me about a year to, to get my wits about me when I got home. And then I started working. I started forming this organization that most of you now know as, as, as Wine's Water. And we did something different as well. We've always done things different from the day one all the way up until now. Instead of just trying to raise as much money as we can to go to all the people with the deep pockets and then buy a monster drill rig and hire a big staff and fly everywhere around the world and pop in a well here, a well there, a well there, give a water filter here and there and say, here's your clean water, have a nice life. We decided to use locals to do the work. We decided to allow them to get involved. We decided to, to show them what resources they had around them so that they could fix their own water crisis instead of always have their hand out waiting for the West to come save them in the next disaster. Maybe after we've been there, they could figure out next time how to save themselves and not rely on us for help. And so we do things like this. This was the second country after Sudan that I went to. This is in Ethiopia. 
a group of, of guys there found out a way to take old Land Cruiser parts and make a well drilling machine out of it, run by only manpower. And you pump this thing in the ground. And after about a day, you get down at about 100 feet. And a lot of places in the Langano region of e Ethiopia, you reach water. And then you make a, a pump out of local materials. In, in Cambodia, we've drilled over 100 wells. When I first started drilling wells there, it cost us $2,500. And now through utilizing local manpower and local materials and, and, and by getting everything uh, done with local help, local villagers, we've, in, we've decreased our cost by five times. And now we're doing uh, a well for $500 instead of $2,500. But remember, remember, a guy like me is not supposed to be able to figure that stuff out. Right? And actually, it's not me. It's not me. They're brilliant. Every one of us in our own way is brilliant. And they know what the needs are. This filter behind me that you see, when I, when I arrived in Haiti on the ground right after the earthquake, I, I felt sick to my stomach. Yes, because of a lot of things that I don't need to get into here on the stage. But you know what made me feel more sick than all the sights that I was seeing that were grotesque? was on the airfields, there were mountains upon mountains upon mountains of bottled water being shipped in. Well, why is that a problem? Why? Well, there were well over two million people displaced. Even if we reached half of those, one million, you need at least three or four bottles of water a day to survive. That's four million plus bottles of water every single day. I went back not long after my first trip, and guess where all that plastic is? You can't hardly even see the port known as Port-au-Prince. You can't hardly even see the beautiful blue water because there's mountains of plastic trash that are being melted down and black plumes of smoke coming up from them. So this was our response instead of bottled water. It's a water filter that costs 20 bucks. I didn't come up with this. I'm not an engineer. A very intelligent woman who spent her life with ceramics gave her life to learning ceramics, spent five years on the ground in the Dominican Republic, right next to Haiti. Her name is Lisa Ballantyne. She is a genius. She figured out how to make this filter that I could take crap water off the street in Port-au-Prince and pour it in the top, and out of the bottom comes 99.9 .9 to the fifth power clean water. Gets rid of viruses, bacteria, anything. So to prove to you, what you have here may not be the streets of downtown Port-au-Prince after a devastating earthquake, but it's pretty nasty. I actually went down and, and, and uh, I, didn't want, I, I didn't want Rick to be the only one that, that got dirty water, so I went and gathered some too. And I mean, if you, if you can see it, the, uh, it's, it's pretty nasty stuff. I know I'm walking off the carpet, I'm breaking the rules. I always do that. This is not good stuff here. And I'm sure the city of Asheville's probably, I know that y'all are awesome and, and green, and, but there's still cars and stuff, and there's runoff here, and it's not great. But to prove, we poured two of those, actually, you didn't see the first one, two of those in the top here, and, uh, and I will more than, more than happy drink what's in the bottom, because I know I would never give someone who, like me, I have two children, one of them's five months old. In the developing world, the biggest threat to that child's life is their water source. Like I said in the beginning, it kills more than anything else in this world. I would not give a parent something that I would not use myself nor give to my own child. Here's to being a nobody. Thank you.